Please remain standing and turn to page one for the invocation. Page one, of course, in the bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Merciful God and heavenly Father, whose grace endures to all generations, you are patient and long-suffering, and will forgive the sins and transgressions of those who truly repent. Look with compassion upon your people and hear their supplications. We have sinned against you and are unworthy of your goodness and love. Remember not our transgressions. Have mercy upon us and help us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins and give us the grace of your spirit that we may amend our ways and with you obtain everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us Bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The first reading for this first Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah, the 64th chapter. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. When you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. You have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Do not be angry beyond measure, O oh Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh Lord, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir, for sticking around for this part of the service and ministering to us in music. As we continue our service, we'll turn back to God's word, and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into the fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand once again for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send, out, he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. We do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. We join together in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated except for the children. We'd like them to come and, and have a seat in the chancel steps, and we'll have a children's message. Grandmas and grandpas, you can come and sit on the steps. We do not charge admission. You don't have to be scared. I would never put an adult in a spot. <laughs> well, how are you guys doing this morning? You doing okay? Oh, I forgot. I got something back here I want to show you. See what happens when you get older? You have these senior moments. 
Wow. You guys know what this is, don't you? What is this? It's a calendar. Well, what is, what is a calendar for? For what? Marking the days, especially important days. That is absolutely right. Yeah, you mark things on the calendar. And my wife is the marker of the calendar. There's lots of very good. Yeah, that's uh, exactly what I do. Now, one of the days on those calendar probably is your birthday. How many of you guys have a birthday somewhere during the year? I thought so. You guys don't have a birthday? Yes, you have a birthday. When's your birthday? March 10th. March 16th. And when's your birthday, girls? One of your birthdays. Yeah, when's your birthday? Oh, she's okay. When's your birthday? October 26th. Grandpa, when's your birthday? What year? No, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> I told you I wouldn't put you on the spot. In February, okay. Emily, when's your birthday? I think it's, I remember it was, last, last year was on October 13th, or this year. Still on October 13th? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, of course, there's other dates. There's mom and dad's anniversary. Okay, Grandpa, when's your anniversary? Now I'm going to put you on the spot. June, June 10th, just two days before mine. Wow. Okay, good. Hey, he is good. Wow, your wife is proud of you. Yeah, there's important dates. Now, we have an important day to cut on Thursday. There's Thanksgiving. What's the next really important day? Christmas Day, you don't even have to mark your calendar. You just know it's December 25th. So that calendar is really important. That's what we do with calendars. Now, I want to show you uh, another kind of calendar. It's called an Advent calendar. How many of you have seen an Advent calendar before? I'll show you what it's like. It, it's kind of different than the regular calendar uh, because today is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent is kind of countdown to Christmas. So we know Christmas is the 25th. Advent, which begins today, we start the countdown to the day when we celebrate Jesus' birth. Now, on that picture, and I'm going to give you each a copy to take home in color, there's Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. What you can do today, and I'll even give Grandpa a copy for himself to color in Mary and Joseph and the baby. Then what's going to happen? Starting tomorrow, you can color in it. You see all the stars? They're all numbered, 1 through 25. And this is the last one. So you start 1, 2, 3. Every day, for the next 25 days, you color in a new star until Christmas. So this will be kind of a fun little project to take home. So we are, we're doing the countdown. You can see the stars are helping us do our countdown to the celebration of Jesus' birth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have so much to celebrate your blessings every day. Most of all, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, whose birth we anticipate celebrating again. In his name we pray, amen. Okay, here we go. Oh, you can have one for your cousin, yes. Want one for Grandpa too? Sure, I'll give, give Grandpa one. And he can share that with Grandma. There you go. Be sure to disagree, a great project take home. Here you go, Ava. And Ella, we got one. Okay, here you go, Evelyn. You can take that one home. That'll hold that for you. I thought you'd be back. There you go. Kids are awesome, aren't they? They're just wonderful. Let's uh, continue our worship. We'll sing our sermon hymn.
may turn on my microphone. Uh, is, this is our first Sunday in Advent, and uh, all the symbols, the colors that adorn our chancel and our altar uh, reflect the fact that it's the first Sunday in Advent. The hymns, the scripture, uh, the readings, the message all center around a theme of Advent. So let's pray as we begin this morning, and we'll look into God's word. Father, we thank you for the joy of gathering as your redeemed people, the people of God, and the house of God, proclaiming the word of God, exalting your name. We pray, O oh God, that the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. From our scripture today, from 1 Corinthians, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, speaking of calendars this morning, this is Jackie, so I borrowed it. I, I shall return it to her 2015 calendar. She always somehow lands a really cool free calendars. Now, if I was to say to you, Happy New Year today, you'd say, uh-oh. I think the pastor's having one of his senior moments, wishing us a Happy New Year, because we all know that's on January 1, and that's about a month away. So it might seem if I said Happy New Year, I'd be a bit premature. But when you look at the church calendar, when you look at the church year, the first beginning with this first Sunday in Advent, it's a new year in the church. We have a liturgical calendar that we follow for a reason. What's that church year all about? I'll sum it up for you in one word, Jesus. Advent, the church year, it is all focused around our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as was articulated for my trusty assistance in the children's message, you use a calendar to mark things down that need to be done on that day. Let me ask you, how many of you have a calendar you mark up at home? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of you do. I use the electronic calendar on my sometimes not so smartphone. And, and because it has bells and whistles, it remind me where I need to be so I don't forget to, to show up. But the fact is we use a calendar we use a calendar to track events and special days and seasons throughout the year. Actually, the church, we do the same thing. We follow a calendar. We keep track of the days and seasons within the church year for a reason, to track, to follow, to commemorate the life of our Lord Jesus. Now, the church has continued a tradition for many years of following a church calendar. And actually, the structure of that calendar really is reflected in the Old Testament. We don't have time this morning to look into that, but we follow a pattern from the Old Testament because as you look at the church calendar, it, it really is structured around the marvelous acts of God's saving deeds in Christ our Savior. So this structure that, that structures our church year really is for a reason, to celebrate, to commemorate, to mark the major events in the life of our Lord Jesus. So all, all the colors, all the symbols in church here, they're not without meaning. Symbols can be great and rich in, in illustrating a biblical truth. They say that one picture is worth a thousand words. One symbol, when understood in its context and its significance as a great object lesson. In that church calendar, the church year is made up of six seasons. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter and Pentecost, and so we commence this year with Advent. But not only are there six seasons in the church year, there are 12 festival days in the church year. Christmas, the naming of our Lord Jesus, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The next festival day is, is Epiphany, the baptism of our Lord, the transfiguration, Easter Sunday, the ascension of Jesus, the Feast of Pentecost. Another festival day is the day of the Tr Holy Trinity Sunday, Reformation Day, All Saints Day. And as we noted last week, some of our newer calendars, unfortunately, called the last year, last week in the church year. That's unfortunate. Historically, it's been known as Christ the King Sunday. And on Christ the King Sunday, our scripture centered around the second advent of our Savior. So these seasons are beneficial in that 
We follow the life of Jesus. We follow his footsteps. We begin in Advent with the Annunciation of his birth, a preparation for his birth. Then at Christmas, we celebrate his birth in Bethlehem. And then there's a season of Epiphany, the journey of his disciple, of discipleship. Begins with the wise men following the star to Bethlehem. Then, of course, is Lent and Holy Week, in which we begin to see the preparation of Jesus' passion and death during those seasons. Then, of course, it's followed by Easter, the glorious resurrection, and then his ascension into heaven. Then, of Last but not least, after his ascension, we celebrate Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So there's all these different seasons in the church year that focus on the various aspects of the life and ministry of our Lord and Savior. So I, I also notice you might have, it might have just slipped past you unnoticed. I want to repeat this. Advent, as we observe Advent beginning today and for the next four Sundays, it's a joyful season, a joyful preparation for the wonderful time we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Now, that's, that's an emphasis we've had in recent years on joy. In fact, on the color blue, as you notice, it used to be that during Advent, the color was actually purple. There was a reason for that, because the emphasis in, in Advent was it's a penitential season. In other words, it's a season of turning from our sins, repenting of our sins, turning to God, and preparing our hearts for the coming of our Savior. That's been a long-standing emphasis in Advent that should still be there. It isn't always, in addition to being a joyful season. Now, on this idea, this notion of a penitential season, we're going to see that in the weeks to come in Advent, we focus on the mis message and ministry of John the Baptist who called people to repentance. But Advent, as a season in the church year, the beginning of the church calendar, is a season of longing, it's a season of anticipation, a season of hope, waiting for the day when Christ will come again. So there's, there's a twofold uh, emphasis in Advent. By the way, you've got to excuse the voice. It just doesn't want to cooperate anymore. That may be old age like, uh, like senior moments. But there's a twofold emphasis in the Advent season. One, we remember the first Advent, the first appearing of our Savior as a baby in Bethlehem. But it's also a season of anticipation as we long for and strain for and yearn for the day of his coming in glory at the end of the age. That will happen. So, you know, you look back to the first coming of Christ, the advent, to his birth in Bethlehem. Now, what's amazing to me is that Paul in, in Acts chapter 10 mentions that his fellow Jews had the scriptures which were read every Sabbath. And so they should have known and understood who Christ was, that this one born in Bethlehem was indeed their long anticipated Messiah. But we are reminded in Scripture he came to his own and they wouldn't recognize him. But to those who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They had the Scriptures read every Sabbath faithfully, as we have Scriptures read here on Sunday morning. And yet they didn't quite see that whole picture. But when the time had fully come, St. Paul says, God did indeed send forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us from under the law. So God kept his promise to send his son, and he did. So, but he also promises in today's reading, in the gospel again, that a son will come his, a second time, not as a baby, and that was reflected this morning as you noticed in our hymns. He's coming not as a baby, a helpless baby in Bethlehem, but as a reigning king of kings, and Lord of Lords. So we are anticipating, longing for, yearning for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those are the words of St. Paul. Paul says, we await the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. First of all, Paul's confession. Christ is our great God and our Savior. And he talks about Christ appearing a second time. And he refers to that appearing of Christ at the end of the age as our blessed hope. Why? Because as we saw in today's gospel reading, it said, Jesus said, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth and he will gather us to himself. That's our hope. So Advent is a season of yearning, of longing for the day when Christ will come and gather us home to be with him forever. He came that first Advent as a helpless baby. He's coming back again at the end of the age 
in power and great glory. So here's what we have, a way of summary in, in Holy Scripture in the New Testament. We have the first coming of Christ, a historic event already completed. We have his return in glory at a time yet to be determined, a time known only to God. Let me tell you, absolutely, as we confess this morning in the Creed, he is coming again. It's just that we don't know when. That privilege, that date on that calendar, you see, God has a, his own calendar. On that calendar, he has marked the date in which he will judge the world in righteousness, Acts 16, 31. That date is known only to God. It is not known on your calendar. Your calendar can mark the day when Christ came as a baby. It cannot tell you when he's coming again in glory, but he will come. He said, all you have, don't have to worry about the day or the hour. You don't have to worry if it's morning, at noon, in the evening. All you need to do is be sober, be alert, be ready, and keep busy. Because when he gave that parable in today's reading about his return in glory, he said it's just like a homeowner that's gone on a long trip. He goes away, and he leaves his servants in charge, and he gives each of them his assigned task. In that parable, Christ is the homeowner that's gone for some period of time. But he gives to each one of us an assigned task of proclaiming his gospel to keep busy, keep sober to alert until he comes again. So his first coming, the second coming. Now what's interesting in this gospel and elsewhere in the gospels, uh, Jesus begins to describe in a very graphic and apocalyptic way the, the events that are happening between his first coming and his second coming. He said there's going to, to summarize it, going to be upheavals in nature. There'll be pestilence, there'll be famine. There'll be upheavals among nations, war, nations fighting against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now, if you look at that church age in which we live, there's been constant, repeated warfare, genocide, bloodshed, and so on. Every generation has known its share of suffering and war. There is coming a day when wars will be no more because Christ will come and he will establish his reign and he will reign on earth as king of kings and lord of lords and we will reign with him. But that, that period of time between his first coming, culminating with his ascension into heaven, is described as a terrible dark time and Jesus said, you know what, it's gonna go from bad to worse. There's gonna come a day when men's hearts will fail them with fear of the things that are coming on the earth. And he said, but when it's dark, it's just before the dawn. When you see these things, look up because your redemption is drawing near. So it's interesting as we look at this liturgical calendar, we look at the church year, the church year begins and ends with a focus on the return of Christ. When that will happen, we don't know. It's not our concern. Our concern is to be ready. So when he does come, we will stand, we'll go out to meet him. He said, you know what, I'm not going to give you a date. I'm not going to give you an hour, time of day. I'm not going to give you even a hint about the details, but I'll tell you what. There's a lesson you can learn from the fig tree. When you look at that fig tree, as soon as its branches become tender, they put out their leaves, you say, oh, summer is near. Well, he said, I'll tell you what. When you understand that, he said, you'll know the signs of the time. He said, because you'll see these things that I'm telling you about. You'll see them taking place with greater intensity than you've ever seen them before. When you do, know that he is near at the very gate. I believe that I don't know the date. If I did, I would tell you. I would tell you, and I would be ready. I, I really would. But we don't know the date. doesn't matter. But he says that the king is near at the gate. I believe that the coming of Christ is nearer than ever before. That day of grace will end and will be ushered into his eternal kingdom. Yes, today we live in a world of chaos and conflict, of violence and bloodshed. And it, it seems like our own nation has gone mad. The world has gone mad. And you wonder where it's all going to go. It looks like mankind is in a collision course with disaster. But I believe as I read Holy Scripture, we're on a collision course with destiny in Christ because he holds the destiny of mankind in his hands. He holds your future and my future in his hands. And it is a glorious and great and wonderful future. You know, every generation has had its conflicts and warfare. And every generation thought it was the last generation. Oh, I'm telling you, we're living in the last days. Your grandfather thought he was in the last days. And his grandfather thought he was in the last days. And his grandfather thought, oh, it's the last days. Actually, they were all right. Because the last days of that period from the first coming to the second coming of Christ. And 
I want to share in closing this morning this hymn. You probably know it well from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Now, my first contact with Wads, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, I had to, in sixth grade, I had to memorize one of his poems. Uh, Under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smitty stands. Anybody remember that in sixth grade? Anyway, I don't, I don't know it all now, but he also penned these words, this hymn, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Now, how many of you know that hymn? I heard the bells on Christmas Day, raise your hand. Oh, really? We're going to have to learn that this Christmas. So since you don't know what I'm going to share with you, great, perfect, because I'll read it to you. And then you'll want to sing it. But let me give you the context. This country has been under assault a lot of times. In fact, our country was torn asunder nearly 150 years ago by what we call the Civil War. Bloodshed, 400,000, almost 500, almost half a million people died in that conflict on both sides. Looking at his country torn in two, ravaged by years of war and bloodshed, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow penned these words in this great hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carol play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought as, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong, and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You hear the anguish and the despair. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song. But then, this is the last stanza. But then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, and the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. It seems like the world around us mocks that song of peace on earth as we celebrate Christmas. Our days are filled with violence and bloodshed. Just watch the evening news, read the paper, read the news online, and you can almost despair. It's always, always just darkest before the dawn. Eternity is going to dawn. The light shall shine, and we shall be with Christ forever. Despite what we're seeing between the two advents, Despite what I see, what we're experiencing every day, between the advents of Christ, we're also witnessing an unparalleled time of grace, the most amazing grace in all of human history, as people around the world are coming to a saving knowledge of the truth in Christ. Even in, in countries where the gospel is banned, even where it is forbidden, even in Muslim lands, people are getting saved because of the amazing grace of God. Yes, it's a time of despair. But you and I are living in a day of God's amazing, saving grace in Christ. Because of his grace, because of his mercy, because of his promises, we can have courage for today and hope for tomorrow. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. It's our privilege and our joy at this time to call in the ushers to worship God with our tithes and offerings. By the way, I do have some more Advent calendars. And if we run out, any of you adults want to feed your inner child and you want to bring that little inner child up and, and do some coloring, I'll make some for every adult to request one.
Father, we thank you that in Christ our Savior we are indeed a people of hope, living in a season of hope. Lord, when we look around, our hearts despair within us. But when we look up, we know our redemption is near at the gate. We long for the day of your appearing, Heavenly Father. There's nothing that hinders our Savior from coming in power and glory, other than the fact that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Lord, in this season of Advent and Christmas to follow, it's a season of light, a season of hope. Let the light of your gospel shine through us into all the world, that the light of Christ would pierce the darkness of sin and despair. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. In a world of chaos, we ask that you grant us peace, O Prince of Peace. In a world of turmoil, that you give us perspective. In a world that is mired in sin and shifting sands, we thank you for the unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us balance, gives us perspective and hope in a despairing world. Father, we thank you for the day when Christ will come, when our faith will become sight, and we shall see him in all his glory. But until that day when we stand complete in his presence, we pray that you'd make us steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in Jesus our labor is never in vain. Father, we pray for each family, for each child in divine presence today. We pray for our children, that you would keep them, preserve them in their faith. Cause them to walk before you all the days of their lives in true righteousness and holiness until that day when they too stand in your presence. Father, protect our little ones, protect our families, keep them from harm and danger, keep them from the evil one. For those that are traveling this Thanksgiving weekend, we pray for safety. For those who are concluding their hunting season, we pray for their safety as well. Father, we thank you that you do hear and answer prayer. For those that are traveling this afternoon, we pray that you'd give them traveling mercy on, in, the, in, the, in the sky as they fly, as they drive, bring them safely to their destination. We pray, Heavenly Father, your blessings upon those that are in need of your healing touch. Those that are, are recovering from surgery, we pray your hand of healing, especially for Cheryl Sager, who underwent heart surgery this week. We pray for others undergoing uh, cancer treatment, for healing, for those going through physical rehabilitation and physical therapy, that your hand would be upon them. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We pray this morning, Heavenly Father, for all families to grieve with the passing of a loved one, especially those who have passed during this holiday season. We pray for the family of Reinhold Graper, who passed away on Tuesday. We commit them to your care and keeping, Heavenly Father. Point them to the hope that is ours in Christ, our Savior. Father, into your hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>